In the previous two videos we took a look at uh, inductors and capacitors and uh, the properties of the voltage and currents going through them, the phase shifts involved, and then took a look at uh, combining those into uh, series and parallel circuits and what happens at resonant frequency when the capacitive reactance equals the inductive reactance and uh, how a series resonant circuit uh, looks like a short circuit at uh, resonance and the parallel resonant circuit looks like an open circuit ideally and uh, and the key here is ideally or it's a little bit what we're going to talk about in this video a couple of commenters on the video had asked about uh, showing some examples and also had questions that and re and recognized rightly so that um, if you solve uh, for you know either inductance capacitance or the frequency that um, for any given resonant frequency you could have any number of combinations of inductors and capacitors that re will result in the same resonant frequency. So how do you pick you know, what to use, what to start with? So first, let's take a quick look and see how these equations were put together very quickly. So uh, we define resonance, obviously, when the inductive reactants and the capacitive reactants are equal. So we set those two things equal to each other. And we can rearrange this formula uh, to you know, kind of solve for any of the particular values. Uh, so we have, you know, basically resonant frequency, inductance, and capacitance. So if we want to solve for inductance, for example, divide both sides by 2 pi and by f, and you wind up with this equation here, L is equal to 1 over the quantity 2 pi squared times f squared times c. Now the quantity 2 pi uh, squared, you can calculate that out as just 39.48. So if you know what resonant frequency you want to operate at and you know what capacitor you want to use, you can calculate out an inductance. Similarly, we can do a similar thing for capacitance. If we know the resonant frequency and inductor, we can calculate out capacitance. You could also solve for frequency and say, if I've got a given inductor and capacitor, we can plug them into this equation, 1 over 2 pi times the square root of LC, to give me uh, what the resonant frequency is. Okay, so. Uh, but like you said, if you take a look at this, that any combination of L, you know, um, and frequency can give me, you know, a particular capacitor and vice versa. So uh, I, you know, I could, if I know the resonant frequency, I could plug in any value for inductor and get a capacitance value. You know, and same thing for the inductor. So how do we choose which one? Just as an example, of how that works. Let's say, you know, in an ideal world, we want to have a 10 megahertz, you know, resonant frequency. And if we start off with a 1 picofarad capacitor and run that calculation, we wind up with 253 microhenries. Okay. But also, let's say we started out with a 1 microfarad cap. The inductor would be 253 picohenries. Well, we get numbers, but how realistic are they and how can they be used? Because both of these combinations would give me that 10 megahertz resonant frequency. So uh, you may you say, well... Uh, from a practical standpoint, you might find that you know one picofarad cap might be too small to be realized realistically in a circuit, given other stray capacitance in your circuit. Uh, also, 253 picohenries is an awfully small inductor, uh, and probably not practically realized except on the surface of an integrated circuit. So, uh, so the reality is that there are very practical, non-ideal factors that determine what we want to do in terms of picking these values. Now, this video is not going to go into all of the practical considerations because that would literally occupy chapters in a book and in books, and it does. But let's just talk about some of the factors here. So at least you understand, you know, kind of what's involved. So, uh, so all components, you know, any, any components that we're talking about have got parasitic properties, parasitic, you know, values associated with them. And what we mean by that is this. Simple things like the component leads, right? The leads are you know, generally, they can either be wires or they're, they're terminations on a surface mount component. But they all have some amount of inductance. Just as an example, a straight piece of wire, a 2-inch you know, length of 22-gauge wire, has about 57 nanohenries of inductance, okay, just by itself without even turning a, you know, making a turn in it. It's about 5 centimeters long, okay. So we've got to add that into the properties of a particular component. At some frequencies, that might matter. Also, the component leads, since they're wires or they're terminations or whatever they might be, they've got resistance. So we may or may not be able to neglect that. Also, you know, if you've got a coil of wire that makes up an inductor, that's a that's wire as well. So uh, that would have some resistance. 
But now at higher frequencies, there's another uh, effect we've got to start thinking about, and that's something called the skin effect. The skin effect basically says that as your, your frequency of operation goes up, the current begins to crowd around the skin or the outer edges of the conductor, it gets repelled away from the center of the conductor. That's true whether it's a round wire like this cross section here, or a, a trace on a printed circuit board or something like that. So well, how, how dramatic is that? Just to put some practical numbers on it, for copper at 1 megahertz, the skin depth is about 0 .007 centimeters. Okay, converting that to inches, that's about uh, two and three quarter mils. Okay, 0 .00275 uh, inches. So put that in perspective, a uh, 22 gauge wire is about 25 mils in diameter. So that says at one megahertz for a piece of copper, 22 gauge copper wire, the current is really crowding only at about 10 percent of the diameter, uh, the outer 10 percent of the diameter of the wire. So what does that mean? Well, that's kind of like having a thinner wire, okay? The current is being carried by a smaller cross-sectional area, so it's going to be subject to more resistance than, is, than the lower frequency currents, which occupy more of the wire. So essentially, you've got resistive losses that go up as frequency goes up, and that's what the skin effect is. So that can become important to consider at high frequencies, okay? Insulators are not perfect. They've got leakage. Okay, you can kind of model that like a resistance. They also have some frequency dependent loss. Okay, and then just so generally the physical construction of inductors and capacitors and other components are going to influence the magnitude of these various types of parasitics. And I've only covered a couple. But let's kind of look at an example of and how this can affect and complicate the situation of just creating a simple resonant circuit. So let's look at capacitors here first. Okay. So, as we kind of talked about, uh, the leads have got inductance, resistance, and skin effect at higher frequencies. That's all going to add to essentially resistance loss in the resistor leads. The dielectric may have some losses in leakage. Some, uh, some might be frequency dependent. That could be modeled as a you know, resistance, if you will, across the capacitor. And then the, even the plates of the capacitor can have some inductance and things like that So associated with the, depending on how that capacitor is constructed. So we go from this ideal capacitor, which only exists in simulation or on paper, okay, to a real-world capacitor that really has various components to it, most of which are not spec unless you go into the detailed data sheet and try to understand what's going on. So you've got your capacitor generally, you know, the, you know, the, the value that's marked on it there. But then there may also be some fairly large value resistor that you can model across it that simulates the leakage through that cap. Some capacitors have more leakage than others. There's also this thing called a dissipation factor, which is kind of the, a model of the frequency-dependent loss of the capacitor. It be modeled essentially the same way. You also have inductance associated with the plates and the leads, okay? And you've got maybe some, you know, some resistance that could be the DC resistance of the wire as well as your frequency-dependent skin effect loss, okay? So all of this is, you know, makes up a real-world capacitor. So capacitors are not ideal like that as much as we want them to be, okay? So what does this mean? Well, I mean, it's certainly one of the, the more predominant uh, factors generally is the series inductance. Because what happens is, as the frequency goes up, this capacitor, the capacitive reactance is going down, but the inductive reactance is going up. Now, obviously, at some frequency, the inductive and capacitive reactance will be equal to each other. And we say at that point that that capacitor is self-resonant. Okay, so it's a resonant circuit all by itself without adding other components to it. So, uh, and what that means is that, you know, this capacitor may not be usable above some certain frequency. So let's take a look at what that looks like, actually. If we plotted out the impedance of a, a capacitor, ideally, is just going to continue to go down as the frequency goes up. Okay. Uh, but what happens is that at some frequency, the capacitive reactance, excuse me, the inductive reactance, starts becoming important and resonating with the capacitor value and we get this dip you know, known as at the self-resonant frequency. Ideally it would go to zero, okay, but you know, zero ohms, but in reality is there's going to always be some you know, frequency dependent uh, skin effect loss and uh, DC resistance, so you're going to come down to some value. And then as you go higher in frequency, the impedance actually starts going up and this ideal capacitor begins looking like an inductor, okay. So this capacitor may not be usable at frequencies, you know, much above the resonant frequency.
So, so it's kind of a, a paradox saying that uh, you know, if a you know 100 picofarad capacitor forms a, a bypass function at RF, it may do it better than a one microfarad capacitor, even though when you calculate out the capacitive reactance, the one microfarad would normally be better. So I've got a quick example here to kind of show you, kind of an interesting little find in my junk box. So here's a, uh, let's see if we can read the value on this, I don't know if it'll focus on it or not. So 103, it's a uh, 10 nanofarad cap, okay, or a 0 0.01 microfarad cap. And I found this in my junk box, kind of interesting, take a look at the uh, the wire on it. Uh, it was never cut, so uh, they used essentially a loop of wire in constructing this thing, and uh, they never trimmed it off, so... That tells me that this capacitor was probably never tested at the factory because it's shorted out. Okay, but what's interesting is we can actually use this to kind of demonstrate this capability. Uh, we've got about three inches of wire or so on here, maybe a little bit less. And uh, kind of from our the previous page, we know that uh, about two inches of wire out of about this gauge has got about uh, 50 to 60, 57 nanohenries of inductance. So we could say this has probably got 80, 85 nanohenries of inductance. Okay, so if that's uh, 85 nanohenries of inductance and a 10 nanofarad cap, we can actually calculate out what the resonant frequency of just this capacitor is. So uh, let's uh, let's actually go do that. So um, let's dial in say 10 nanofarads. Okay, and we're going to multiply that by oh let's say 85 nanohenries of inductance. We'll take the square root of that and multiply that by two and by pi and take one over that and we see we've got about five and a half megahertz so uh, surprisingly enough this little shorted out capacitor is going to have a self resonant frequency probably in the neighborhood of between five and six megahertz so uh, we can actually go take a look at that with our uh, little uh, grid dip meter that we looked at a couple videos ago so uh, if I take this uh, capacitor I just kind of stick it on here to kind of couple it to uh, the wire there Let's turn the uh, grid dip meter on, adjust the level here. And if I kind of sweep through the frequency, we can actually see, okay, there I'm getting a dip. Okay, dipped way out, and if I come back, it's going to come up here again. Okay, and what we'll find is that, uh, let me kind of get this coupling here a little bit different. I want to try and weaken the, the coupling there a little bit so I get a good defined dip. So there I can actually see I've got a dip, and then it, it comes back up again. Let's go back until I get the dip. Oh, let's say right about there is my dip. And there it is sitting between 5 and 6 megahertz on the orange scale. We want to verify that. Let's pop the capacitor off here and uh, bring this guy up to my trusty little frequency counter. And there we are, about 5.5 megahertz. Okay, so it all kind of, uh, all kind of fits. So uh, you know, if we wanted to design a resonant circuit with this, we probably, you know, like a, a simple LC circuit, we probably can't do it for frequencies anywhere approaching five and a half megahertz would have to be used somewhere down here okay now similarly inductors have got the same you know problems if you will real world issues let's go look at an inductor okay so an inductor is nothing more than a coil of wire sometimes air wound uh, sometimes round on some kind of a bobbin that could be a ferrite or powdered iron type of core okay but because it's a bunch of wires you know kind of all sitting next to each other you know, there's going to be some capacitance associated from turn to turn, a little bit of inter interwinding capacitance. Okay, of course, the wire itself is going to have resistance and skin effect losses as well. And uh, so uh, we can model our ideal inductor now uh, with these various parasitic components. We've got the, you know, series resistance and skin effect losses, as well as um, the interwinding capacitance it kind of looks like a capacitor shorting this whole thing out. Okay, so um, you start talking about a, a property of uh, inductors called the Q. The Q of the inductor says how good is it? Now, ideally, we want the you know this doesn't even really enter into the Q. The Q really is a, a ratio of the capacitive, or excuse me, the inductive reactance against the equivalent series resistance. Okay, so the lower that is, the better the Q of the inductor. But uh, kind of getting into the whole discussion of Q is a little bit beyond the, uh, the scope of this video, but just to kind of, if you ever hear about that, that's really what we're talking about. But now, um, one way to reduce the interwinding capacitance is to reduce the number of turns or space that turns out. And one way to do that is to wind the uh, inductor around some kind of a uh, magnetic core, like a, a ferrite material or a powdered iron material. 
Uh, so that does tend to reduce the number of turns, uh, therefore it would reduce um, you know, the interwinding capacitance. And it could be dramatic. I mean, uh, for a given inductor, you might have, if you need 10 times fewer turns or, or more um, you know, to achieve the same inductance. However, the core itself is going to add another loss term. Okay, and, and usually it's frequency dependent and current dependent. And the way we'd model that is like this. So we're still going to have some interwinding capacitance. We're still going to have, now we're going to have some additional loss as well as the skin effect and series resistance loss. So our simple inductor is now really something like this. Okay, and uh, again, if we look at the, gra the graphic properties of that again, just like we did for the capacitor. You know, an ideal inductor would just continue up in, in impedance as the frequency goes up, okay? But at some point, this interwinding capacitance is going, the reactance of that is going to start to approach the inductive reactance, and we're going to approach essentially a parallel resonance circuit where the impedance starts rocketing up, okay? And that would get limited by, you know, things like losses and other things like that. Um, and then above the resonant frequency, Okay, the capacitor is now going to start taking over, right? So the device is actually going to start to look capacitive. So just like the capa uh, capacitors we looked at earlier, um, really you can only consider that device, you know, uh, kind of in an inductor or capacitor below resonant frequency. Above resonant frequency, it kind of almost inverts. So just like the capacitor where we may, may only be able to operate it within some certain frequency range, the inductors are the same way. So now if we took, you know, our simple diagram of a uh, series or parallel um, you know, resonant circuit, okay, we really have to replace these guys, okay, these simple uh, uh, representations of inductance and capacitance with their more complex models to really do an accurate job, okay, of, of really modeling what that resonant circuit is going to do. Uh, and again, there's literally chapter and verse written on, on this. And uh, there's really no one answer in terms of how you design a resonant circuit. There's just too many factors that are involved. But uh, so the point of this video is not to kind of go into all of those factors, but uh, just to illustrate the fact that uh, it, a very sim relatively simple problem can become complex uh, pretty quick. A little extra credit on, uh, on the videos here. Uh, we took a look at uh, a practical measurement of a, uh, a little shorted capacitor. Um, to look at its self-resident properties. We can also look at the self-resident properties of an inductor. Here's what they were using in some of the previous videos, this little 220 nanohenry inductor, or excuse me, 220 microhenry inductor. Um, so what we'll do is we'll couple this to uh, a coil on my grid dip meter. Okay, similarly, I'm just going to kind of stick it in here to kind of have it sit and kind of have it be coupled to our test coil. Okay, and uh, if we turn the, uh, the oscillator on, We'll notice here at, uh, you know, I'm down at low frequencies, I don't really see anything going on here. As I go higher and higher in frequency, I start to see a dip, right? You see the dip coming there, and then it's coming back up again. So I can actually go and find that actual dip, what frequency we dip there, and uh, let's go play with the coupling here. Sometimes you got to play with uh, where these things sit and that kind of a thing to kind of get a better you know, coupling into the, uh, the dip meter here and I can actually see that dip kind of occurring right about there and then it pops back up again so let's kind of dig down into that dip so right in that neighborhood right there so if we look at in this case the red uh, scale we're looking at about uh, between two and a half and three megahertz so we know the resonant frequency of this particular inductor is between two and a half and three megahertz which means that any circuit that we're going to use it in okay uh, whether it's a switching power supply or a resonance circuit or something like that, would have to operate at frequencies significantly less than two and a half or three megahertz, so the thing is still behaving like an inductor. So, uh, so we find that the, this grid dip meter becomes quite handy to help you understand uh, what the self-resonant properties are of capacitors and inductors, and give you a better idea of what frequency range you can still use them on, uh, and still have them behave in a predictable way. So anyway, I hope you found that helpful, and thanks for watching.